Uh, hello, good evening. Yeah. Welcome to the Ford School of Public Policy. My name is Brian Jacob. I'm a faculty member here at the Ford School and director of Close Up, the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. It is kind of hosting the event. Um, uh, I am very excited about tonight because uh, in addition to being the director, um, my kind of primary area of research interest is exactly education policy. Um, so I am eager to hear what uh, the think tanks think. Um, I'd first like to thank, before I start with the introductions, I'd first like to thank uh, Chuck Wilbur for putting together this whole panel. Um, we are just kind of the forum and figureheads here. He is the one who has brought all of the speakers together and organized this as, I think, part of his class. Um, uh, then I'd like to also thank Bonnie Roberts and Tom Avaco from Close Up who have uh, done a great deal of logistical work for the event. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank our uh, speakers for tonight. Um, I'm going to do brief introductions now, so just, just to kind of go over the format here. I'm going to do brief introductions, very, very brief. Then we're going to um, start off and we're going to have each of the speakers talk for about 15 minutes, kind of giving their general views, not met, no kind of strict guidelines on education policy in the, the next Michigan. Um, then we're going to open up for questions. We're first going to have uh, a series of questions uh, that I'm going to pose to the panelists, and then we're going to open it up for you know 15 or 20 minutes of just completely open Q&A from the audience. So we'll be uh, here till about 8:30, um, and hopefully we'll learn uh, a lot in the in the meantime. So uh, first, and the uh, speaker, the order of the speakers is alphabetical. So starting, uh, John Bebo will start us off. He is the executive director for the Center of, for Michigan a nonprofit think tank, uh, uh, think and do tank. Um, he has uh, had wide experience in a variety of areas, and I'm, in fact, I'm reading the bio, and I didn't even really know this. He's 16 years an investigative reporter um, for the Chicago Tribune, Detroit Free Press, and other papers, um, and covered the 2003 invasion of Iraq uh, for the Detroit News. Um, and he knows quite a bit about education policy in Michigan. So a, uh, a man of all trades, Next will be uh, uh, Lynn uh, John Dahl, who is uh, with uh, the, let's see, the uh, Michigan Prospect. He got just, I believe, just uh, stepped down as the executive director. Um, he has a uh, long career in Michigan state politics, having been a state representative for 22 years. Um, this followed his uh, work as a campus pastor. Um, and he's been kind of interested and involved in education issues and a variety of other social policy issues for many years here in Michigan. And fi finally, we have uh, Michael Van Beek, uh, who is a member of the, the Mackinac Center. Um, he joined the center just in this past year as the director of education policy. Before that, he had uh, served as an administrator and teacher at a private school in Grand Rapids. Um, and we're glad to have him here as well. So without further ado, I will uh, turn the mic over to John Bebo. Um, for 15 minutes, and if you're getting short on time, I will start flashing cards at you, so. Thank you. I don't know how Chuck Wilbur avoided being up here. He's the guy who really knows education policy. He's the education uh, expert for the governor. Um, we're just the pointy-headed think tank guys. But um, the Center for Michigan, uh, we come at this from a, a consumer perspective. I'm not going to sit up here and spout a lot of economic study at you tonight. One of the things that, that we've done in recent years is try to engage the public around Michigan in a discussion about what they want in the future of Michigan. We've held about 600 town hall meetings across the state in the past three years involving more than 10,000 people. And, and they have some pretty strong views about education. I'll try to touch on just a few of them. You know, when you talk to citizens, they, they talk at the menu level, not the recipe level. They're not gonna talk to you about their millage rate. They're gonna talk to you at a, at a broader broader level, and I think a lot of my comments will be reflective of, of that as well. One thing we've heard citizens tell us around the state is, is they're open to changing how schools teach and changing what schools teach. And one of the more provocative things we've heard people talk about is, is preschool, uh, education before the age of five. Uh, people are, are, are tuned into this thinking that an awful lot of the brain development happens between the ages of zero and five, 
and we could offer universal pre-K in this state to about 70% of the kids for about $300 million a year. That's about 2% of the school aid fund in our state. If it would be that cheap to offer pre-K, why is it that almost all the money goes into the system after the age of five? That's one question we've had people ask a lot. A second thing that we've heard people um, say they're open to is, is transforming operations and funding of local schools. People are frustrated with these never-ending budget fights and schools not knowing what their budgets are going to be. Um, they'd like a more stable funding base for schools so they know what their kids are, are facing before they get in the classroom every fall. But they want, in return, a real sense that schools are operating as smartly and as efficiently as they possibly can today. Another thing that they want in terms of operations and funding is affordable higher education. Uh, one way to get at that is to attack the cost of prisons. Michigan is one of a handful of states that spends more on its prison system than it does on its university system. Another one of those states is California. The governor of California has just said, has just pledged that he's going to reverse that or try to reverse that. You can get at that through a couple of ways. You can change who you're putting into prison and you can also make, make prisons more efficient. You may see some billboards around the state this fall uh, saying prison guard, toughest job in Michigan, Michigan's toughest job. That might very well be true. It's an extremely difficult job. But if it's Michigan's toughest job, isn't it also Indiana's toughest job? In Indiana, we, they pay prison guards 30% less than they do in Michigan. Why do, they, why do we pay so much more for prison guards here? We're in an age where it's really tough to raise taxes. It's about reapportioning resources at the state level. And one area that we could do that is in prisons. But a third thing we've heard people talk an awful lot about is higher standards um, in our schools. They want better results coming out of our schools. They want more accountability. Um, they want to understand better why, why we can't get rid of bad teachers and why we can't reward really good ones. They're eager to experiment with things like merit pay, and I'm sure that's an interesting issue around here right now. I, the new movie that's coming out, uh, waiting for Superman deals with that. The Vanderbilt study that I'm sure some people in this room are familiar with just came out. As I said, parents and, and local business people that, that come to our community meetings, they're operating at the menu level, not the recipe level. They don't know all the answers. But I would challenge you in this room, if, if you're the up and coming education experts, answer them. How do we reward teachers for doing a great job? Our, our state school superintendent has suggested that maybe one way might be to do some kind of merit pay system at the building level, so there's more of a team sense of, 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 of reward for performance. But another thing we've heard um, parents talk about is classroom time. Uh, we've heard parents around the state uh, be concerned. They say, we're not sure our kids are in school as much as they used to be. Uh, the center is run by a, a bunch of formal, former newspaper reporters, so that perked our ears up a bit when we heard that, and we went out and found the data on it. And, and what we found uh, shocked us and shocked a lot of other people around the state. One of the reports that, that you have in front of you tonight is called School Days, Michigan's Shrinking School Year. And Briefly, what it says is that about 40% of Michigan districts are now offering fewer than 160 days of instruction every year. The informal national standard is 180 days. Add that up over a student's 12-year career, K-12, that's a year and a half, fewer days of instruction over the course of a career. They're not doing this to experiment to make education better or to make outcomes better. They're doing it strictly as a budget-cutting move. That's a serious issue. That's what I will argue to you tonight. It's partly a consumer issue. I mean, as taxpayers, we're paying for a full school year. We're not getting a full school year back. As a result of this report, the legislature did put some, some tourniquets around the, the bleeding last year. They've said that over the next couple of years, every district needs to get back up to 170 days. Uh, but that's one of the clear examples I can raise to you tonight on how what we're doing now is somewhat out of step with what the consumers of education expect 
from educators. Just a couple of views into the future that maybe we can talk about in Q and A. We're going to have about 200,000 fewer students in Michigan's K-12 system um, five years from or seven years from now than we did seven years ago. You're going to hear a lot of discussion over the next few years about per pupil spending and how big is the school aid fund. Well, just a question for you. If we're going to have 200,000 fewer students, if we're going to lose 15% of our capacity, isn't there room for some savings in that? Isn't there room for some creativity in the buildings we use and in the number of districts we have and in the services that different school districts offer? And lastly, I think we're reaching a point uh, in Michigan where we've really got to ask ourselves what's most important in our school systems. Football season at the local high schools began on August 25th. That was the first day for high school football games this year. Classes began two weeks later. What's most important in our K-12 system? I've done some writing about the Plymouth School District and a group of parents, hardworking parents who get together at night and talk about class size matters. They're very concerned because they're seeing a lot of their high school and middle school classes now at 30 students per class. I took a look at their teacher contract. There are more than 200 coaches in that school system that are making a premium <coughs> based on high school sports rather than teaching in the classroom. What's most important? I'll leave it there and, and I look forward to Q&A. <clears throat> Thank you. I apologize in advance, which a speaker should never do. No, that's not right. That's it. Yep. Uh, because I have a cold in my head, and uh, I, I, uh, I've been told by the doctor I'm no longer uh, uh, spreading it. So, if you trust him, and I don't, uh, <laughs> you're safe. The, uh, I, I want to do a couple of things here, uh, and, and primarily what I want to do is set some context uh, of uh, financial, uh, the financial picture for school finance in Michigan, because I believe we need that understanding in order to see where we're going and, and what uh, future options are. Let me tell you some assumptions that I carry into uh, this discussion. One of them is that the state is in a fiscal crisis, and I know that's shocking to you, uh, the, uh, uh, but it is the context in which uh, our discussion is taking place. And almost daily, that reality gets reinforced. Uh, as I came down uh, this afternoon uh, listening to the radio, I'm hearing the latest report from the Census Bureau about, again, the drop in uh, our median income in Michigan. The, the, the biggest picture, the, the most accurate picture that describes where we are is that, that we have become a low-income state in terms of household income. And that's a serious drop from where we were. Uh, years ago when I uh, first began serving in the legislature, decades ago, when I first began uh, serving in the legislature, uh, we were seen as, as one of the three states, uh, Michigan, Alaska, California, with the highest uh, 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 income, household income. We're now down uh, somewhere around 37, 8, something uh, like that. Uh, so that's the, uh, the kind of overall uh, picture. So schools are only one public service under assault. Uh, there is both the financial reality and there is a, a pretty widespread and growing, apparently, anti-government uh, uh, mood out there that uh, puts all of public services up for uh, uh, a good bit of assault at the present time. No public service stands alone. So if we're to talk about it at some point, how do we get out of this? We ought to be talking about how do we do it together with a whole lot of other public services and, and, and challenge uh, the cannibalism that is, is so much a part of the current uh, uh, financial debate. The problem is not, I think, government funding, uh, excuse me, a government uh, formula. Uh, and the problem is, uh, you know, not our education finance formula pr uh, proposal. A, the problem is that we don't have adequate, fair, stable 
uh, funding system for the services that we want. And, and we haven't <coughs> figured out how to uh, uh, put that together yet. Frequently, Proposal A is pointed to as the problem, usually not described how it's the problem, except it, Proposal A is the problem because it's the mechanism we have. I would argue, uh, yes, Proposal A ought to be tweaked. It, it's, uh, it, it in, is, invites that and, and should constantly be uh, reevaluated. But inadequate funding is, is the problem if, in fact, we're going to do what we say we want to do in terms of overall uh, educational programs. Proposal A was created uh, to address the elimination of the property tax for school operations. Prior to Proposal A, 65 percent of, of school operations were paid for out of local property tax uh, dollars, revenues, uh, 35 percent from state funds. Uh, at the, at the, the present time, uh, post-Proposal A, it's getting close to 80 percent are state funds uh, now. And I'll say some more about that in, in a few moments. Uh, so we are in our system paying people less, we're hiring fewer people, we're reducing benefits for our public employees and so on, in education but more broadly in, in public service uh, generally. We're getting rid of more expensive teachers and hoping we can get less expensive teachers to replace them, although there's some challenge to that by, by some of the local uh, uh, school boards. Uh, so we're looking at various kinds of, of, uh, of uh, reforms. In that, let me now turn to kind of the, the background, but those are the assumptions that I'm, I'm carrying and, and uh, uh, behind my thinking. Uh, the Michigan Prospect several years ago uh, convened a dozen former state representatives who had negotiated Proposal A, the, the, the school finance uh, uh, proposal and to put it on the ballot. Six Democrats, six Republicans came back together. Now under our, our mandatory and experience law in Michigan, uh, those people are not allowed to still be around in office. Uh, so we, uh, but we invited them to come back together and raise in the presence of two uh, research writers, one of whom is, is here tonight, Mike Adonisio, uh, to sit down and say, what did you think you were doing? when you fashion Proposal A, and what does it look like now? And they came up with a, uh, a report, a study, uh, answering the questions that these uh, uh, legislators raised. And this is uh, uh, where you can find that, and it's uh, uh, the full report. I brought uh, probably a couple dozen copies of it in hard copy here that uh, I think Bonnie can tell you where they are at the back of the room there somewhere, uh, and if, uh, if people are interested in that. And uh, Mike Adonisio and Doug Drake were the two uh, uh, primary authors of, uh, uh, of that. And I've tried with Mike, as, as we've over the years uh, talked about updates on that and, and where we're going, uh, to uh, put together some, some material on that. If you look at, at school revenues, essentially, the biggest chunk is from state restricted monies, and we, I'll, I'll show you specifically more about that uh, in a moment here. Uh, federal dollars, uh, uh, local dollars, uh, the state uh, general fund, uh, but it, it's the state restricted dollars that are, are the, uh, uh, the biggest chunk of that. The federal monies include uh, no child left behind dollars, uh, special education monies, free and reduced uh, lunch monies, and other uh, federal revenues. The local operating revenues come from the 18 mills that are levied on non-homestead property, uh, the special education mills uh, that are voted, the vocational education mills, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, operating mills. Uh, the, this, I think, is a, is a more helpful outline of where the dollars come from to show you in, in millions of dollars uh, where the, uh, the state uh, funding for uh, uh, education comes from. And as you can see, the biggest chunk of money is the state sales tax. And that, with Proposal A, that was the, the shift from the property tax to uh, the state sales tax. That sales tax is, uh, 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 in, in our economic situation, not a growing revenue. In fact, none of these, these uh, revenues are, are growing revenues. 
Uh, in fact, people are, are, are even smoking less. Uh, and all of you should be smoking more if we're going to, you know, support the, uh, the educational uh, program. It's kind of a, a moral responsibility, I think. <coughs> the, um, one of the questions that, uh, that uh, frequently comes up is, uh, where does the lottery money go, uh, that $700 million? That amounts to eight and a half to nine days of funding the, the school system. It goes to education, but it's not a huge chunk of uh, the educational uh, dollars. The Michigan business tax as a part of uh, the school aid fund is a reducing percentage of the school aid fund. It, it, uh, reducing because of various tax uh, loopholes and, and, and expenditures that have been uh, uh, developed uh, and, and reducing because of shifts in uh, the, uh, the business tax. Uh, the income tax, there's uh, earmarked monies from the state in income tax uh, for schools, the state education property tax, and then the sales tax. Uh, and, and the sales tax, as uh, you probably know if you follow the public policy uh, debates at all, uh, the, the sales tax, there are various proposals to uh, expand it, uh, to uh, include some services, and then perhaps to reduce the overall all rate uh, and, and other uh, proposals to uh, tamper with that. Uh, the uh, uh, sales tax figure, in, incident, I should tell you, that's a, the, the number you can't read is a four, so it's uh, uh, 4720 there. Uh, the property taxes have just plunged, as, as you know, uh, because logically uh, property values have, uh, have plunged, so uh, that has uh, been a significant drop. But that's the, the overall <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, the overall uh, policy uh, funding uh, background. Prior to Proposal A, there was a guaranteed tax base uh, formula. Uh, the local voters selected the tax rate, the spending level, through their millage uh, votes. Uh, the state would then guarantee a minimum per pupil revenue yield per mill of tax effort. The foundation formula, which is, uh, came along with Proposal A, uh, says that there will be a certain number of dollars per pupil essentially paid uh, uh, by the, the state. Uh, and, and this then becomes a, a real shift from the local property tax to the state sales tax with the state then deciding, uh, maybe a local school district says, we would like to add uh, a program in, in our district uh, and we're willing to raise the mills to do that. Well, you can't do that anymore. Uh, you now got to take it out of uh, the, uh, the basic uh, foundation uh, dollars. That's essentially the, the, you know, the basic change in, in uh, uh, the school finance uh, picture. The, uh, the local property tax uh, before uh, Proposal A, before 93, uh, 94, uh, covered about two-thirds of operating revenues. If you look at these examples, uh, what we had developed was the rich schools, poor schools uh, phenomenon with real inequities. Inequities of two kinds. One being how many dollars are behind each student. Uh, on a way, 3,277. Bloomfield Hills, 10,358. But the other inequity is on the other side of that, and that is uh, very different numbers of, of dollars behind each pupil, but significantly different uh, millage burdens, uh, who, who was having to pay that. So uh, although you had uh, uh, in, in uh, Ypsilanti uh, 43 plus mills levied, uh, you had uh, only raised $5,900 per pupil for that. Bloomfield Hills uh, with, you know, 24 mills, uh, 10,358. That's primarily a product of the value of housing in those two different uh, uh, communities. <clears throat> and you were lucky if you had a nuclear power plant in your district, but there were not <laughs> enough of those to go around uh, as well. The uh, uh, proposal A then uh, set up a, a, a series of, of goals. One was to reduce, although not eliminate, per pupil gaps, uh, reduce and limit property tax for operations, reduce <laughs> local share of operating costs, increase state funds and state share, and provide greater stability in, in funding. The uh, per-pupil foundation levels 
uh, from beginning on this chart on, uh, in 1994 and, and going through uh, uh, 09, you can see what happened. There were uh, uh, the low spending districts, that blue line at the bottom, uh, were uh, given the authority under Proposal A to increase, but not the whole way at, at first, but to gradually increase till they reached the basic, uh, the basic level of, of funding. The, and that's the, uh, the red line. The green line at the top was the, what had been the former out of formula districts, the, the higher spending district where people had voted additional millage for, for higher spending districts. And uh, uh, they were assured that in the future, under Proposal A, they could con there would continue to be a gap, but it wouldn't grow. Uh, the, the gap wouldn't be uh, uh, expanded. The legislature uh, in, in uh, 2005 or 6 uh, chose to uh, eliminate the, the basic funds and, and put them all up at the, uh, at the higher level. Uh, the school aid fund in, in the last year, the current uh, year, uh, found a reduction in the foundation dollars, uh, ISD operations cut, uh, cut in categorical monies, uh, cut in, in payments to uh, some of the hold harmless districts, uh, and, and an additional foundation cut that uh, was debated. Uh, but I, I list these only to suggest that what we're now doing is talking about how do we cut money out of uh, the education budget. Uh, it's not a question of how do we what do we want to do, who do we want to educate, how do we want to expand that, it's a question. I'd, I'd say our basic debate is, is a cannibalism debate. Uh, uh, what are the things that we can uh, cut out and what can we pay for at the expense of somebody else without going to additional revenues? Uh, this is a, is a chart of state membership uh, and, and important because under the Proposal A funding, the current funding, uh, the dollars follow the students. And therefore, as the number of students in a district drop, as they are dropping overall, then obviously that district uh, finds itself uh, uh, hurting. The uh, enrollment patterns, therefore, become a critical uh, financial issue. Declining enrollment creates fiscal problems in, in states, and very few districts are, are steady growers. Uh, and uh, the declining enrollments are not just an, an urban issue. The, the, most, the greatest declines are here in red, uh, and you can see that many of them are in uh, rural areas as well. So we're not talking simply about urban education. The two shades of blue are, are the areas of, of growth. And it's, it's interesting because so often we think the problems in, in finances are in the urban districts. But in fact, as you can see, uh, they're, they're pretty widespread uh, within the state. Uh, if, if you look at the uh, blue line here, that's uh, over 70, from 1978, 79 through 2007 and 8. Uh, what we've seen happen to state and local revenues for school operations. And uh, as you can see, uh, they have grown. Uh, if you adjust them for inflation, however, the, the bottom line, they haven't grown uh, uh, very much. Has A succeeded? There's a reduction clearly in per pupil gaps. Property taxes are reduced and limited. Uh, major change in state and local share, clear shift to uh, state financing, and uh, revenue stability, uh, as you can see, has suffered for many uh, districts. Uh, many districts saw improvements through 2004 in terms of finances. Uh, that, those increases are eroding now. This is a chart that shows fund balance, savings accounts, as a percent of current operating expenditures in, in schools. And you can see the schools have had, but are now seeing a reduction in the amount of money that they've been able to squirrel away uh, while they wait for uh, leg legislative action or while they wait for uh, something to happen to uh, uh, give them the ability to put a budget together. The assessment cap on property taxes is, is critical. Uh, value of property cannot increase more than uh, 5% or inflation, the lesser of those two figures. So that green line is essentially if you had the increases uh, in value uh, without the cap, the, uh, uh, the uh, taxable value is the, is the red line, showing that the districts are, are receiving more than they would had there been the, uh, 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 the uh, SEV increase. And that's why your tax bill, your property tax bill, is so confusing to read. Uh, we've seen unexpectedly large foundation increases, 
uh, disappear now, uh, there's over $2 billion worth of tax legislation that has been enacted that has taken monies out of the school aid fund. Uh, Doug Drake did a study of that some years ago, and, and uh, there's a huge amount of money, not advertised as education legislation, <laughs> tax legislation that for other reasons reduces the, uh, uh, the monies available uh, for uh, uh, education. Uh, the challenges now as we go ahead that are, are the political challenges is one is capital funding. Uh, proposal A didn't deal with that. It left it the same as it is now. You go to local voters for millage. De declining enrollments uh, are, are another uh, challenge. The impact of charters and choice on traditional district enrollment that is having a major impact in some uh, uh, districts. Uh, erosion in, in the uh, tax base overall. Uh, the costs of personnel and, and fringe costs uh, are ongoing. All of these uh, challenges uh, that we face. This is the uh, 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 fringe benefits, essentially, uh, cost per pupil uh, uh, through 2007-8, and you've seen the increase uh, in, in that. Uh, the capital funding, as I say, we didn't make a change in, uh, in the state, so that still is a question. Is it possible for school districts to go to voters and ask for a millage for, uh, for votes? And, and in fact, they've been able to do that in uh, a millage for buildings and, and been able to do that in, in many cases. The declining enrollment uh, figures, they, they have uh, an unpredictable impact because you see great jumps and then you'll see drops and, and so on, and there's not a consistency in that. But remember again, this is having an effect in districts across the state, in all kinds of uh, uh, communities. Uh, the, uh, I, I'm <coughs> self-conscious about timing here. Uh, the challenge is, as I think we now have, are meeting the demands of the, the race to the top. Uh, an example, uh, it, uh, one of the legislative pieces enacted in the race for the top competition was to increase mandatory school attendance age from 16 to 18. That may do a number of things, uh, get a number more students uh, in, in those uh, limited years, uh, uh, limited hours of, of education. But somebody somewhere is going to have to pay for that. It's, it's, it's a cost, an added cost. Universal, high quality, early education. We have now in Michigan, uh, the policymakers, uh, have, have essentially eliminated one of the programs that we know works best, uh, and that's the preschool program. Uh, and and uh, you're probably familiar with neighboring Ypsilanti, the Perry Preschool Study, 40 some years now, uh, looking at what happens and following uh, people who went through a preschool program from the same neighborhood, people who did not, uh, and, and every standard is, uh, shows significant uh, uh, benefit for those who went through those programs. Knowing that, uh, policymakers have chosen to eliminate uh, funding for preschool. Uh, it's a kind of political logic that we, we need, maybe need to talk about to help you understand. Uh, the importance of, uh, of non-school uh, human services. Uh, it's pretty hard to, uh, to educate people without being uh, concerned about uh, where they're coming from and, and the homes they're coming from. Uh, so a rational tax policy will address fairness, stability, efficiency, and adequacy, and that's the, uh, the challenge we have before us. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for, for having me here, and thank you for the, uh, the student group who supplied me with Happy's Pizza before the event. That was much appreciated. Uh, I try to get Happy's every time I come to this area. Uh, I'm going to talk about improving student learning with fewer resources. Lynn already alluded to a lot of this, but uh, you know, Michigan schools are in a very precarious situation, and that is that they have ever-rising higher standards and higher expectations uh, put on them by local parents, which is, that, that's a really good thing, uh, but also by the state and by the, uh, in a, larging, uh, a larger extent um, than ever before, by the federal government. And in Michigan, we have fewer resources than we did. Uh, as Lynn mentioned, we are moving from being a relatively wealthy state to being a relatively poor state. And we are uh, trying to 
uphold a public school system that was built when we were a relatively wealthy state. So um, how can we do this? Uh, how can we improve student learning with fewer resources? I want to go through um, some of the things that we've tried. We've tried more money for our public schools. Uh, this chart shows uh, operating expenditures uh, per pupil, um, and that's not capital costs, this is just current expenditures. Um, from 1960 to 2007, we spend almost four times as much as we did in 1960 uh, after adjusting for inflation. We've tried more money, and, and this is not just a Michigan thing, this is across the board nationally too. Uh, only, except for two times in the U.S.'s history, have schools received, uh, on average, lower per pupil revenues. That was during the Great Depression and during World War II. And the U.S. is one of the leaders worldwide in how much we spend per pupil on K-12 schools. We've tried putting more teachers in classrooms. This is from 1996 to 2009, uh, basic program teachers. So this is classroom teachers. It's not instructional aides. It's not parapros. This is uh, classroom teachers. The ratio has dropped from uh, 24 and a half students to about 22 and a half students per teacher. And this again is a national phenomenon too. Uh, we've tried more employees. From 1996 to 2009, our, per, our student to employee ratio went from slightly under nine to uh, under eight. And uh, from 2003 to 2009, which is one of those periods where we've uh, lost a lot of uh, uh, state wealth over that time, um, our admin, uh, people in administrative staffing positions in our school grew by 10%, while the number of pupils in our schools decreased by 6%. Uh, over that same time period, uh, employees as like consultants, coordinators, supervisors, directors, and other su support staff grew by 23% over that same time period, while enrollment declined. Um, so we, we've tried more warm bodies in the classrooms, um, and it doesn't seem to have worked, and I'll show you uh, more about that through these slides. Here's total per pupil spending. This is every dime that we spend on K-12 uh, education here in Michigan uh, per pupil, adjusted for inflation from 1994 to 2009. Here's our eighth grade math scores on the nation's report card. We've got about a half a percent increase. This is by far our best um, score. This is fourth grade reading on the NAEP. We're up about 2%. Eighth grade reading and math is down by about 2%. Uh, I, use, I use the NAEP uh, because it's considered the, the, the best standard for um, judging student progress over time. And almost by any other standard that we use, we see um, that we haven't gotten a whole, lot, a whole lot for what we've spent on our public schools over the last uh, uh, decade and a half. Uh, SAT scores have gone up by about 6%, but only 5% of Michigan students take that test. Um, ACT scores have remained relatively flat, and you see that big decline there in the green. That's when we started requiring all students to take it, and it's, it's flatlined since then. And graduation rates uh, were about 70% in 1994, and now they're about 75%. Um, so we did see a little bit of an improvement there. So what do we do? Well. I think from what we've tried, uh, spending more money is not necessarily the answer. Uh, I think we need to look to other states and see what they are doing because other states are having success with improving student learning. And by far the best example of that is Florida. And I want to tell you what Florida has done over the last 12 years with their public school systems. They created a genuine school accountability system. And by genuine, I mean they didn't water down their standards and they held schools accountable for when they did not perform. Uh, in Michigan, we have about three overlapping school accountability systems that uh, rate our schools. They, they give them a grade and they give them a certain level of proficiency and they mark them as AYP and some are failing and some are not. Parents don't know what in the world that means. It's changing constantly. In Florida, they did something revolutionary. They grade their schools like this, A, B, C, D, and F. That's it. I've been told that in Florida, when those grades come out, the state shuts down because parents are so interested in finding out what the score of their, school, their kid's school is. Um, and what happens in Florida when a school is an F, when a school receives an F, 
Uh, parents in that school are empowered to send their kids to other schools. They can send their kids to charter schools, they can send them to any other public school district that they want, and they can send them to private schools using a voucher system or a tuition tax credit system. Uh, in Florida, they expanded learning opportunities, as I just mentioned. They allow uh, students to take advantage of a, a tuition tax credit scholarship program to send kids to private schools. They use a tuition tax credit scholarship program for students with disabilities. They expanded the number of charter schools that they have in their state. And they created by far the largest virtual school in the country. It has eight times uh, more enrollments in Florida's virtual school than any other virtual school in the country. The other thing Florida did is banned social promotion after third grade, which I think puts, uh, creates incentives for parents to make sure their kids are learning. Uh, because it's not always just the school's fault when kids don't learn. Parents um, are sometimes to blame too. So uh, no parent wants their kid to repeat fourth grade or fifth grade. Um, so in Florida, your kid has to score at a proficient level on the state test in order to get to the next grade. That put, creates an incentive for parents to make sure that their kids are learning. Florida also instituted a uh, teacher performance pay kind of system where if a school was given a, an A, uh, teachers in those districts, or I'm sorry, uh, if, a, if a school showed a certain level of growth within the district, um, teachers in that district got uh, a bonus. They used alternative teacher certification to improve the labor force and um, uh, create more, uh, a, a more diverse uh, working force in the schools. And they created more early education options. There hasn't been any uh, research yet on how effective this is. This is relatively new uh, in Florida, but um, it's, it's voluntary and what it does is it allows uh, parents to use a voucher basically to um, attend any private preschool that they want to or they can uh, attend any preschool at a local public school as well. What has Florida got for this? Here's fourth grade reading scale scores from 1992 to 2009. As you can see, Florida was one of the worst, had one of the worst scores in the country in 1994. Significantly lower than the US average and significantly lower than Michigan's average. Over the next 14 years, they passed both the United States average and Michigan's average significantly. This is by far the largest gain by any state uh, on any standardized uh, or on any NAEP test. And I use fourth grade reading here uh, because it is, uh, you know, a lot of experts would say that if a child is on track uh, by the time they're in fourth grade with reading, um, they're much more likely to stay on track uh, as they progress throughout their uh, school career. Here's more details about the Florida miracle. Uh, if you can see in the bottom right, if you, if you look at the state of Florida there, African-American students in Florida's average fourth grade reading score was 211. If they were a state, the African-American students in Florida would outscore eight other state averages. That's the average for all of their students. Hispanic students in Florida's average is 223. If they were a state, they would outscore 31 other state averages, including Michigan. Florida's not just improving um, the, the high flyers in their school system. Uh, it, it is the, the, the students who are uh, the lowest performing traditionally who are the ones that are benefiting the most from Florida's system. So one of the things that we can do is, is, is model um, policies in Michigan after some of the things that Florida did. And basically what they're doing is they are taking into account the fact that schools and teachers and administrators and school board members act just like everyone else in the universe. They respond to incentives. And they put incentives in place in their schools for them to improve student learning. The other thing that we need to do in Michigan is improve teacher quality. Um, outside of uh, a student's background or um, socioeconomic status, uh, teacher quality in the classroom is the most important factor that determines how much that student is going to learn. Um, it matters more than the size of the class. Uh, it matters more than, uh, I would argue, with, with John, probably the amount of time that they spend in that class. Um, of course, if it's three minutes, then it's not really going to, that's not going to matter. But um, teacher quality is the thing we need to focus on. Uh, and what we need to do is hold teachers accountable for student performance to some degree. 
Uh, I don't mean that we need to uh, base all of their evaluations on how students perform in the classroom, but uh, it has to be taken into consideration. There are local union contracts in Michigan that strictly prohibit the school from looking at student performance when it comes to evaluating teachers. Uh, and we need to reform pay structure for our teachers. We pay our teachers like their 20th early 20th century industrial assembly line workers, um, as if they're all equal and as if they're all interchangeable. Um, teachers are not widgets. Teachers are professionals. And we need to uh, pay them um, differently uh, in a way that, and, and I don't necessarily think that we need to create uh, a widespread merit pay kind of system, but dis just uh, differential pay. We need to pay physics teachers more than we pay uh, teachers who are in, who are in uh, subjects where we have an oversupply, uh, something like uh, you know, social studies or something. So um, we need to attract the highest performing teachers by paying them more uh, in areas where we need them. And of course, none of that can be done without reforming tenure. And Colorado has, has done this successfully. They created a, a more accountability-based tenure system where teachers uh, basically, if they have a poor evaluation for two consecutive years, um, their tenure is um, then going to be reviewed again, and they have a couple years to uh, uh, reform and, and to get back on track. Uh, alternative teacher certification, uh, which has had success in Florida, is something that we need to continue to expand and unleash the virtual learning capabilities that we have. Um, you know, we still pretend like kids need to sit in seats in a physical classroom in front of a physical teacher to learn. They don't have to do that. Uh, we need to identify who our rock star teachers are and then get them, get as many kids as we can in front of them. And through virtual learning, we can do that. Other ideas for change uh, and categorical funding. Uh, that was another thing that was part of Proposal A was to get rid of uh, all of these different categorical funds that the state legislature uh, decided to use to, to fund different school districts in different ways that they chose. Uh, we've sort of moved away from that, and now we have more than 30 different categorical funds that go to schools. And uh, I think that uh, local school administrators and school boards uh, are better at spending their money than what uh, bureaucrats in Lansing are. And that's an example from uh, charter schools. That's one of the things that they're able to do. Um, differently than what uh, public school districts are. Uh, dual enrollment, we need to break down this idea that there are, that there's a K-12 system and then a higher education system, okay? Our end goal is to just teach kids skills, all right? Whether that comes through the K-12 system or the community colleges or vocational schools or higher ed, um, it shouldn't matter. Uh, virtual schooling, as I, as I mentioned, um, has a lot of potential to reduce costs by scaling and to put more students in front of high performing teachers and ultimately what we need to do is create incentives create an educational marketplace create a place where schools um, innovate uh, to essentially compete for students to compete for um, uh, for consumers and uh, you know we know through history that monopolies don't work very well and uh, we've done very little to address this fact when it comes to our public schools. Um, just one uh, brief uh, final example of this. Today is the most important day on the school calendar. Does anyone know why? It's count day. It's the most important day because schools need the kids in the seats so they can count them to get paid for them. Right? So this is a really important day. We do that today, you know, I think in Detroit they offer them iPods and pizza parties and all sorts of things just to attract them to the class. And then what do we do uh, tomorrow with those, with those students? We, we don't even really keep track of them until the MEEPS, MEEP test maybe next spring to figure out whether they were learning anything, okay? So uh, we need to create incentives within the districts to serve the students and serve the parents uh, at all times. Thank you. It's also a really important date because it's picture day in a lot of schools. And I don't think those are coincidental. I don't think those are coincidental. 
Okay, so uh, we'll thank, uh, I'd like to thank the panelists and now we're gonna uh, have a few questions. I have some uh, from Chuck's class that I'll start with. One I, um, are these just generally addressed to all the panelists? One might be more specific. Okay, so I, um, I will uh, start with this and we'll let uh, just kind of the same alphabetical order let people respond. Um, question number one. Uh, many studies have been done comparing the low upfront costs of pre-K programs with high returns to society. Um, are politicians receptive to this, receptive to this uh, comparison? Is it politically feasible to increase early education, um, uh, early education period? I think I couldn't quite read the last part, but I think that's so, the main uh, thrust of it. So I never get the last word, is that right? Yeah. Well, I never, okay, get, let's, we'll start I never get the last word at home either. Um, why don't we, why don't we, we, can, we can go backwards. I'm, you, I'm flexible. You can, you can say the last word first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Michael, why don't we start okay. with Michael. Uh, so early education, uh, you know, politically, politically feasible. Uh, sure, yeah. I, I want to uh, push back a little bit on the research on early education uh, because, you know, the, the research on early education shows that there are several programs that are really, really great, like Perry Preschool Program, um, like the program that was in Chicago, um, like I think there was another one in North Carolina, North Carolina um, that we've studied again and again and again that show high returns, long-lasting returns over time. Um, but what we don't talk about is those programs were uh, extremely expensive. They were intensive. They were much more than just an added year of school. They involved um, at-home visits. They involved um, uh, pr uh, post-preschool tutoring. Uh, they involved uh, parental counseling. So um, when we talk about preschool, uh, we, need to, we need to define what we're talking about exactly. Are we talking about Head Start and Great Start, or are we talking about these really intensive, expensive uh, programs like, like the Perry Preschool. Uh, and when you look at Head Start in particular, just this last year, the United States Department of Health and Human Services did a study of more than 5,000 students in Head Start. And after one year of Head Start, they identified 114 different positive um, benefits to the students in Head Start. Not one of those benefits was there after first grade. Okay? Uh, the, the research is not clear on how effective all early education programs are. We know that some are, uh, but not all of them are. Whether it's politically feasible, um, I think from what, what John has heard from the, rest of the, from the rest of the state is that parents are really interested in it. And even without a universal uh, public funded system, we have still about 70% of uh, parents send their kids to preschools and they, and they fund them on their own. So I think it is politically feasible. Okay, Lynn? The uh, one measure of political feasibility would be to look at the last couple of years of uh, budget activity in the Michigan legislature in which essentially the preschool funding has been eliminated. That doesn't suggest uh, that it's real feasible uh, politically uh, at the present time. Now the reasons for that I don't think go back to what Mike is talking about. I, I don't believe there's been a, a serious policy debate in the legislature about which are the good and which are the bad uh, preschool programs. Uh, I, I don't think there's been that kind of sophisticated uh, discussion at all. Uh, and uh, it would seem to me if you're trying to argue that uh, some preschool programs are not good, therefore we shouldn't fund preschool, is, is a difficult argument for me to uh, uh, affirm. Uh, but I think politically, under the present uh, circumstances, uh, preschool is seen as an extra education program primarily. Uh, most of the education establishment is not invested in preschool. Uh, it's uh, in invested elsewhere. Uh, and so as a consequence, it becomes competitive in our cannibalistic discussion with uh, other programs, and I think that that reduces the political feasibility. I would partially agree with Michael. Quality is is a huge issue with preschool, 
and in the preschool world, there's a lot of hand wringing about it. But quality is an issue throughout the education system in general. Anybody here, just raise your hand. Did you think 12th grade was a blow off here? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? Well, if, if you get a beer, if you can get uh, some of our state education leaders to have a beer, um, some of them will, will tell you after a beer that, you know, they get a wild eye in their look and say, what we really ought to do is get rid of 12th grade and educate four-year-olds instead. Pretty radical idea, and they'll, they'll only say it openly after a beer. I'm only half joking. I mean, these are the kinds of things we got to be, we got we to think about changing the whole system. We've got about 40,000 kids in Michigan, um, by some studies, who qualify for the publicly funded preschool programs we have now who aren't in them because there aren't slots and because of bureaucratic snafu and other reasons. In terms of political feasibility, uh, last year the, our state senate tried to zero out the pre-K program, $100 million, tried to get rid of it. One of the wackier arguments that gets made for this is, oh, this is another government's conspiracy to take kids out of the home. And uh, you look at the research, the brain development is all occurring between, the, so much of it is occurring between the ages of zero and five. But we've got an old agrarian model school system that doesn't begin to deal with that fact. We've got to find some political feasibility to get students learning earlier. Okay. Um, and actually following up uh, with John, this is a, a question specifically for, uh, for you. Um, so I do get the last word. You get the last and now the first the word. Only. Um, so your 10,000 Voices report mentioned several educational actions that no politicians seem to be talking about. School curriculum overhaul, increased uh, parental involvement, college affordability. How do you get legislators to focus on these issues when uh, school funding seems to be the first issue on everyone else's, uh, everyone's education agenda? Well, I'll just take one of them, uh, um, higher ed <laughs> affordability. It's the first area that we're going to now to cut is to cut university funding um, because it's, it's a pot of money that's, that's accessible. You know, if you look at our general fund budget in Michigan, um, more than half of it goes to either human services or to prisons. That doesn't leave a lot left over. And when you're spending more on prisons than you are in universities, I would argue that's just not a sustainable system. It's just simply not sustainable. Um, but we've not gotten a lot of movement in the legislature to deal with that. I think you've got two gubernatorial candidates here who have taken this issue on, and um, hopefully it's not just lip service. They're saying that higher ed is important, that the competitive workforce is important, and we've got to invest in that. Yeah. Just a, a quick follow-up um, uh, relating to political feasibility and kind of your community conversations. So I think the, the conversations about the length of the school year, the importance of kind of sports versus academics, um, it, you seem to kind of be suggesting in some of your you know, comments that there was the kind of groundswell, you know, popular pressure for kind of some reforms I think you know, personally would make sense. Um, but it, it's not clear to me that, that those really are feasible. I mean, it, you know, would school, would the population of Michigan be willing to give up their sports programs uh, to reduce class size? I mean, is that what your community conversations are suggesting? No, they're not. It, but I think we're reaching a point where we're cutting libraries, we're cutting textbooks, we're, we're maximizing class sizes. That's an issue. The center wouldn't exist today if there was a clear bridge between citizens and our state legislature and getting things done. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm here <laughs> because that's part of the problem. Uh, citizens are extremely frustrated at the, the gridlock and the lack of working together, the partisanship in Lansing on issues like this, the fact that we never get a budget done on time because it's always about political gamesmanship instead of getting things done. Uh, one result out of the community conversations um, that we've been able to make a little progress on in Lansing is that for the first time in this session in the legislature, there's a bipartisan caucus of legislators that, it wasn't too many years ago, about the time the center was being formed five years ago, 
we'd go talk to legislators and they literally didn't know the names of people across the aisle. I, Lynn, I don't know if it was that way when you were there. I hope it wasn't. No, it wasn't. But, but lit legislators literally tell, they don't know that person over there. They, they mistake each other for staffers pretty regularly. In that kind of environment, nothing is getting done. Okay. Um, one last question from, uh, from the note cards and then to the audience. So, um, what education policy issues do you believe the next governor uh, will address and what actions will they take? So this is, I guess, a uh, not what they should address, but you know, what are the one or two things that you think uh, the next governor will do or try to do? Michael? Uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, I don't know. Um, when, I, when I hear both of the candidates talk about education, they sort of talk in very uh, general terms, and I, I'm not exactly sure what kind of things that they'll, that they'll look at. I've heard both of them talk a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, creating efficiencies, uh, you know, limiting uh, rising costs that we have, but um, I've, I've been disappointed, uh, quite honestly. I, I haven't heard specific things that they well, we know some stuff, uh, and, and they know some stuff. Uh, and w one of the things that, that we know is that uh, they're going to have to address uh, educational funding uh, in the context of, of an overall uh, budget debacle. Uh, and, and what we don't know is how they're going to do that. I'm predicting that they will uh, do a very political thing, whichever uh, of the candidates uh, uh, wins, and that is they will call upon uh, uh, the establishment of some panel uh, to uh, uh, think these things through and uh, uh, work on a uh, uh, proposal. And uh, I'm, I'm not often a betting man, but I'm open to a deal on that. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> And, and I think that will happen because they, they will be forced to uh, address not only the specific issues like are we going to fund preschool versus um, uh, promised scholarships versus earned income tax credits and so on. They're going to have to look at that whole uh, uh, budget situation and there will be a great deal of pressure uh, uh, on them. And in fact, I think it will be smart uh, of either of them uh, to uh, uh, lay out. A, a, a panel of that, uh, of that kind uh, and, and give them substantial authority. If I were uh, uh, one of them, <clears throat> or if one of them were listening to me, neither of which is likely to happen <laughs> ever, uh, I would take the emergency fiscal uh, uh, commission that uh, Governor Granholm appointed, uh, chaired by uh, Governor Milliken and Governor Blanchard, uh, which is an excellent document uh, from five years ago uh, and uh, which has uh, now been uh, celebrated by some of us uh, annually on Groundhog's Day just because uh, nobody's ever looked at it or done anything uh, uh, with it and so on. It's an excellent document that, that I would convene people around and say, okay, let's take this bipartisan document of thoughtful people uh, and uh, who have some political insight and so on, and savvy. And let's use that as the starting point uh, for a discussion about the overall state budget and plug education into that. Coming right off of that, one of the issues raised in that, in that panel of experts four or five years ago was the idea of service sharing and, and, and consolidation in schools and local government. I think that's one area that could get traction uh, under the next governor. They both talked a little bit about that. And a lot of that in schools could, resolve, could revolve around the ISD level in terms of sharing services, uh, payroll, um, uh, counseling issues, uh, bus systems. I, Mike Flanagan, the state superintendent, I, I'm, I probably don't have my exact numbers straight here, but he talks about the, the many different school bus systems that we have in Wayne County, uh, many different kinds of ways of purchasing tires, repairing the air filters, putting in new seats, painting them, hiring and firing and, 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 and maintaining bus drivers. Uh, there may be some ways to reach some economies of scale by doing things more regionally, 
we're not talking about creating mega school districts where we've got you know, one school district for a million kids or anything, but service sharing is, is one idea that, that has quite a bit of traction and comes right out of that report. Based on what the candidates are saying, uh, I, I also am, am a little bit hopeful that there might be some change in the preschool funding uh, uh, environment. Uh, I think both candidates have talked about the importance of pre-K and uh, they may try to put some money into that. There's only one spot that you're going to see the candidates on the same stage at the same time talking about education or anything else. It's on October 10th. The center's hosting the only gubernatorial de debate they're going to do. It's going to be on TV stations across the state. Hopefully they will provide some enlightenment that night. I think they'll both be for education. Yeah. Do you? <laughs> well, why are you against yeah. it? Uh, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Just kind of a follow-up to what you guys were just talking about. Um, in terms of trying to reduce the cost of services, and I think Michael may have written something on uh, the privatization of services. Uh, can you guys speak a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, we do a, a, an annual survey um, about how many districts are privatizing. Um, one of their three main uh, costs of non instructional services, which are uh, transportation, food, and custodial services. And um, about 50% of districts now use uh, contract labor for at least one of those services. And the, the main reason they do it is because it saves money and uh, because they have rising costs elsewhere in their budgets. And um, you know they're they're expecting lower revenues in the future. Uh, a lot a lot more districts are looking at that as an option. So I, I would expect that to increase too. Okay, uh, in the back there. Yeah, um, I'm just um, I'm a student teacher right now. I'm at the School of Education here at U of M. And I'm student teaching in Detroit, and uh, what I what is very obvious is the difference in funding, you know, between here and between Detroit and the school that I went to here in Ann Arbor, which is Pioneer. And I just, um, in light of the race at the top and how schools are held accountable, and um, in response to that, the ones that are suffering more are losing money. And that's like all of Detroit. How can we improve schools in Detroit if all, if if they're, by, if they're being punished with less money, when they have to address challenges that include uh, lower academic success, like for example, my students, some of them cannot read at all, and some of them have trouble finding where the United States is on the map, which, for the record, um, makes social studies as equal to math. Um, and I just, I just don't know how we can address the situation when and as, and as like the city, Detroit, like used to move us forward as a, as a state. If all the resources are resources are taken away from lower performing schools, I feel like we're doing the chances of improving education. Okay. Uh, um, we yeah. <laughs> I'll fix it really quickly. Um, <laughs> We don't always take money away from failing school districts. In fact, there's a, a pot of money in Michigan where we actually put money into school districts that are failing. We actually reward school districts that are losing students. Uh, I'm not sure that's, that's, that's going to work either. Um, some years ago, there was a huge bond issue in Detroit, uh, one of the biggest bond issues ever. Um, and uh, the results of that weren't red hot. Um, Detroit has some of the lowest scores anywhere ever recorded on, on tests. There's a lot of concern about what to do about Detroit. Um, and it goes a lot deeper than funding. Uh, there's a huge conflict between rural Michigan and, and urban districts. Um, these are huge problems, and I don't think anybody has a real solution for them. Well, I, th I think that there needs to be an identification of cause and effect in terms of uh, what creates the kinds of problems you're articulating. Uh, and, and much of our response so far, unfortunately, has been to apply some structural template and say, if the mayor made the decisions instead of the school board, or if we could do away with the influence of the unions, or, or things of that kind that don't get us into 
the cooperative discussion, cooperative between <coughs> parents and, and uh, uh, educators uh, in, in the community uh, and, and others who, who've got a stake in, in that education system, to say, okay, let's, let's talk about uh, cause and effect. Uh, when, when it was said to uh, Mayor Archer uh, by uh, the governor and legislature, you're going to become responsible for running the schools in Detroit. Archer foolishly agreed to do that. I say foolishly because nobody said, here's what needs to be accomplished. Here's what the goals are. Here's what we want to see happen. And so as a consequence, it was simply a matter of somebody else administering uh, a system that really the basic kinds of changes uh, didn't occur. We know some stuff again. We know that uh, there's a positive correlation uh, between uh, uh, home stability and, and, and wealth and student performance. There have been a number of studies. Wayne County Risa did one, and there, there have been uh, others of, of those. Well, if that's the case, then that would tell us that uh, it's, it's not alone what happens in the classroom, but it's also what happens outside the classroom, and somehow we have to address that. And, it's, it's that discussion that I think uh, would, would be an exciting one to, to see nurtured, uh, but uh, uh, is a difficult one to put together. It's also dangerous to paint with a, a too broad a brush here. There are some huge educational success stories in Detroit. Wayne State runs a fantastic summer math program for kids that don't have many advantages. I believe it's the Roberto Clemente School on the southwest side of Detroit. They've created an incredible community of learning um, that brings parents in after school, uh, and their, their test scores are doing very well. We've written ab about that school a little bit um, on the center's website. University Prep Academy um, is an amazing success story. They're sending graduates to college at, at an unbelievable rate. Uh, I think we can do more. Uh, looking at what is working in some very challenging areas and, and try to replicate it. Right. I want to just kind of, uh, given the time here and kind of given all the question hands I've seen, let's have short questions and short answers if possible. Um, <laughs> yes, you. Okay. Um, I'm thinking Michael, but really if anyone has a comment. Michael, you mentioned you were talking about the reforms in Florida and Colorado. And I'm specifically interested in teacher buy-in and union effect. I don't know much about unions, but I've heard that Michigan teacher unions are very strong compared to other states. And so while the reforms sound appealing and certainly the charts are ones we would like to uh, claim, I mean, how applicable would their plan be in our state given the union situation? <laughs> well, I mean, that would be applicable. It would just be how feasible would it be uh, to get some of those changes in place. And um, the, the Florida Education Association fought uh, many of those reforms uh, tooth and nail, and the Michigan Education Association would do the same thing. Um, you know, uh, Michigan, we, we, we think we have a really powerful teachers' union, and I, I suspect that we do, um, but uh, I hear the same thing from every other person in every other state what's that right well there's just an education association though. yeah there's a professional association yeah yeah but they don't have right they don't have mandatory dues and, and uh, things like that so yeah. well it's, it's a professional association which is not a union which is not a union just keep the facts straight it's not a union okay professional yeah the florida education association oh okay uh Uh, Michael, I was interested in your comment about doing away with categorical funding. And it sort of plays off of uh, the comment the young lady made in the back. Categorical funding, in, in theory and in practice, um, is really aimed at providing additional resources to kids with special needs. I mean, that's the whole purpose of categorical funding. All kids are not alike, as you well know. And some kids have special needs of different sorts. School districts. Uh, rural school districts would have much more uh, need for transportation assistance, say, than a suburban school district. 
if you did away with categorical funding, how would you address the special needs of those kids and those schools? Yeah, when I'm talking about ending categorical funding, I'm not talking about programs like Title I or uh, special education funding that goes, to, that goes to ISDs and things like that. I'm talking more about um, some of the things that, that John talked about where you know, we reward schools for losing pupils, uh, we pay schools for um, you know, being in a cer certain geographical area where they don't collect as much tax revenue because they're in renaissance zones and things, other things like that. I'm not talking about uh, special education funding or Title I funding or things like that. So that uh, there and then. I'm um, interested in, in your thoughts on uh, the, the recent growth in the charter movement and um, whether you think that this is this is a long term or short term um, trend and, and if you think it's, it's helping or harming public schools. I, I know you mentioned um, making, making education more of a competitive market so in, in that way maybe you feel it's, it's benefiting schools and and maybe in some other ways, um, I'd like to hear how you think it's, it's been hurting public schools. The, uh, <laughs> uh, you're on a roll. <laughs> there's, We're getting rolled. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's a good deal of research that I that I think begs us uh, to uh, to be begs to be taken seriously uh, now on on impact of uh, uh, charter schools. We see dramatic things happen in terms of uh, uh, some very dramatically creative things happening uh, where uh, teachers unions have come together and essentially organized uh, schools and, and uh, uh, in, in very creative uh, kinds of situations. We see the research uh, that I, I read a couple of weeks ago suggesting that overwhelmingly uh, by by many uh, a review of, of many of the studies, uh, there's not dramatic indication of improvement as a result of, of charter education. That uh, the students are performing uh, that much better. It's something like 17 percent of of students in in charter schools perform better than their surrounding traditional uh, schools and so on. So it, it seems to me, depending on how much we can trust the testing that leads to that conclusion, uh, it's pretty hard to say that's going to be a movement that will, will grow with great hope of uh, uh, dramatic uh, improvement. The, uh, uh, it, it does, uh, there, there are a variety of, of studies that suggest uh, there are patterns of segregation and so on that are in, enhanced. Uh, and, and nurtured by uh, uh, charter school uh, development. And that the charter school's ability to turn away some students, uh, it, uh, the more difficult students and so on, is uh, uh, just heaping a greater problem on the traditional uh, schools and so on. So I, I think there are enough questions out there that it's hard to see that as a, uh, 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 you know, a major uh, solution uh, although I think there's, there's a lot of attractiveness that people have, uh, find attractive uh, the concept of, of uh, competitive uh, schools and schools of choice and so on. The, uh, uh, how that's playing out, uh, I don't know. I live in a school district that is, is uh, running around looking for ways to, uh, to get students to uh, uh, buy into their, because of the, the head count funding formula, uh, you know, to come. Whether that's going to result in improved education, uh, it's too early for me to say. It's a huge okay. topic. I'll try to be really brief. One of the biggest disappointments with charter schools is their athletic performance. I mean, a lot of them don't, they don't even have football teams, for goodness sake. How can they call themselves real schools? Yeah. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just add one thing on, on uh, what might be the future for race to the top legislation created a, a flex cap. So if uh, certain charter schools perform well, um, it'll create a slot and opening for another uh, charter school. So um, I think they, they will continue to be a part of the system. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. You come in first, but the, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I really don't know uh, what the, uh, uh, the elements of that were, and, and it becomes more difficult for me to understand it the more I read about the criteria of uh, race from the top. I mean, it, it would be pretty hard to understand uh, what you had to do to go through those hurdles. I don't think the states that won know why they won. So uh, figuring out why we lost is virtually impossible. I, I'll, I'll give a slightly less smart, smart alecky answer. Does it matter? I mean, the amount of money involved was a tiny percentage point of what we already spend on schools in Michigan. And the whole thing seemed to me to be quite a distraction from some of the more fundamental issues that we're dealing with in but Michigan it, schools. But it would matter, John, if, if, it was, if it was a test of whether reform you know, a test you trusted the, of whether reform was uh, occurring. It wasn't I, a test. It was a money chase. Well, that's, okay. But, that's all but, it was. But the degree to which that's the case, then I, I, I think you're right. Uh, but we also changed a bunch of policies in terms of Michigan as a result of that. We did. And, and one policy there that, that's going to be interesting to watch is written into the law is the idea that, that, that student performance has to be built into teacher evaluation. That's going to play out at the local school, school district level. That's going to be fascinating to watch. And if some of you are working on grad projects, boy, I think there's a great one there. Given the fact that uh, we want our students to succeed and our community to succeed on a global basis, I think we may be benchmarking the wrong direction in terms of looking at what's happening in another state rather than um, you know, what, what the, the, the most successful um, because many of the national national school systems are about the size of our states, and some of the other the most successful. Um, do you think that's a more uh, productive place to look sometimes? Yes. I like that answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, I agree. I, I think there uh, there are good examples uh, in in a variety of settings. I, I think looking at other states, though. Um, can be beneficial still because it's, um, you know, the, the political, um, the way it plays out politically is, is more likely to be similar state by state than it is country by country. So. Sure. Question to that? Uh, given all of the claims that are out there, uh, people talking and changes come about, do you think parents and teachers are at a point now that they're willing to sit down and look at these plans and start impacting upon what they really can be. For example, I've heard very few things mentioned about what are the role of parents in this game plan, number one. The mentoring process, you said reading was essential from the early grades. Where's the call for more mentoring for kids to start reading and turn off their dog on television? <laughs> uh, especially reading and math. It's critical now. We're talking about getting ready for the 21st century and beyond. Second question, what is the media's role to point out the good things that are happening in education so that we can follow those good role models and stop nicking picking around and get down to the brass tacks of, OK, it's financial needs to do or there's things that don't take money to do, like attitude change. Where are we going in that direction? And I agree with you. The Chicago uh, uh, you know, school systems making major changes. Long school days, I was mentioning that over brother might be mentioned. <coughs> the Chicago school system, especially African American males, picked that dramatically. And this school system had over 90, no, 100% of their kids going to college. I'll take the second question about the media from that world. Um, what media? Uh, the, the number of reporters covering education and every other public policy issue has dropped precipitously because people aren't buying newspapers. Um, there just aren't that many people covering this issue. That's why groups like the Center and the Mackinac Center have jumped into that space from certain perspectives to try to cover policy in more depth. The last question we've asked in all of our community conversation is what's going right in your community? What's, what's working really well? It's why we know about the Roberto Clemente School. It's why we know about things like the Hastings Public Library over in West Michigan. Uh, it was built a few years ago by kids literally riding downtown and handing in their penny jars. There was no millage, 
It was, it was paid for by the citizens in that community. There are success stories going on every day. We're writing about just a tiny handful of them at the center, and we do a newsletter every week. Please sign up for it. You'll be able to read some of those. There's, there's, um, I'm, I pull out of the, uh, my folder here, uh, Extra, which is a magazine of, of uh, outfit called Fair. Uh, their September issue deals with uh, covering the race to the top, and they're looking at the question you just raised of how has the media covered uh, the whole education uh, uh, reform uh, movement and so on. And and I think it's worth looking at uh, uh, because it, it's it's quite uh, uh, provocative in suggesting that uh, the media has, has worked off a, a, a script that uh, doesn't necessarily deal with uh, uh, um, specific examples, uh, but deals more with uh, uh, prejudgments that, that are brought into uh, that discussion. It's worth uh, looking at. I think John is, is right. There, there's, if you look at the state, there isn't much media coverage of education uh, as such. Do you want to add? Uh, well, I think um, from, from the media perspective, I, I wouldn't expect them to report good things that are happening in schools because um, it's, it's not a real good story um, to hear about, you know, Johnny going to school and learning his fractions and doing his geography and learning a little bit of English, too. Um, what is a good story is, you know, some of, the, some of the really bad things that happen in schools, and that's, um, you know, if, if we can figure out how to change that, um, that would go a long way. I think, you know, uh, parents and teachers and uh, school officials need to let the media know about the good things that are happening in their school, and the, and the kind of stuff that John's doing is great for that. We have uh, time for one more question. Um, uh, well... Uh, go ahead. How about why don't you both ask a question? Same time. Same time. <laughs> one. And we'll all three answer it. Uh, why don't you ask your question briefly, ask your question briefly, and then Paper you can choose to say something that responds to that or uh, anything else you think is useful in concluding. Yeah. Good. Um, so you all sort of critique the race of the tap, no child left behind programs a little bit. So I'm interested to know what, would, what you would like the federal government's role, if any, to be in education policy in the state of Michigan or in our states? Okay, great question. Uh, I wonder what you guys think we lose and gain when we use market or certain marketizing frames, which they most strongly, or some, you know, we use terms like consumers or private, and, and things related to privatization, what we gain and lose that way, and not treating education as a special good. Okay, role, uh, role of the feds, uh, and then kind of cost benefits of the kind of market place framing of education issues. Uh, John. Um, the, the special good idea. Um, I think by educators looking at uh, parents and students as consumers, I think we gain a lot. It's the way uh, the rest of America works. Did, did I, I would like to see the feds. Uh, uh, be uh, not the educational policy makers uh, because in truth uh, that's not the major uh, source of uh, funds and, and so on uh, but but to provide uh, almost foundation like uh, uh, funds for innovation uh, that are uh, are available for uh, creative proposals so we're going to look at some of these things that are working these pilot studies these examples uh, and, and find uh, uh, some source of funds uh, to cause things to happen. Currently, school districts don't have any that backup money to be able to do those those kinds of things, and, and it would make sense to uh, to have that without saying, you know, here's here's the conclusion we want, but but here are the sources of funding. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the federal role, you know, the federal government didn't really start getting involved in uh, public education until 1965, um, and their their results, the improvements that have happened since then, are uh, hardly detectable. So I'm skeptical of any sort of benefit from having the federal government involved in an issue that has uh, traditionally been a local and state issue. Um, as far as um, 
you know, looking at education as, uh, as a consumer or, or in kind of more in a competitive marketplace, uh, you know, I just concur with John. It, it, it's, um, the more we focus on, the great thing about the uh, market type environment is it's always focused on outputs. And we don't do that enough in our public school system. We need to focus on uh, what our outputs are instead of just what our inputs are. So, and what I mean by uh, the way the rest of America works, they are consumers. I mean, there are reasons that districts lose students. And, and it's not because, uh, uh, you know, uh, Martians came and took those students away. It's because parents voted with their feet. Um, <coughs> districts who ignore the fact that they're consumers are, are ignoring pieces of their product. I, I'm getting more and more uncomfortable can I, can uh, I? in this discussion. Uh, okay, I, can, can uh, I think I'm going to have to you know, Just know I'm uncomfortable. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, everyone be assured that Lynn is not comfortable. Uh, yet we will uh, conclude. Thank you very much for coming out. And thank you to the panelists. And uh, I, I imagine if